بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على النبي الكريم وبعد honorable brothers and elders and sisters when we all declared the shahada la ilaha illallah and the other shahada muhammad rasulullah the shahada thing what we are saying actually is that we all believe and truly believe from the bottom of our hearts that our success lies by following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we believe that all the guidelines and guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he has given us this is where true success lies as well and you know the early generations if you listen, if you read this biography of this of the people who lived in the first second and third generation we're talking about the sahaba the tabi'in and the tabi'ut tabi'in if you read their biographies, if you read, I'm not saying that you know those eras were, you know, they were all sinless people. There were no sins committed, you know. No, none of that. It's just that the khair and the barakah and them following the commandments of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was very dominant. Majority of the people they truly believe from the bottom of their hearts that they will find tranquility in Allah's commandments. They will find contentment in the Sunnah and the Hadith of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's what they believed. Imam Abu Nuaim in his Hilya mention a very interesting story about the, the, uh, about Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and his mannerism of Khilafah. Umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he's a Khalifa by the way. He could get anyone to employ to do the work, but he himself physically and personally would go out in the night to patrol the whole areas and, and streets and roads of Medina until he's very tired and then he'll return home. So he feels happy that Alhamdulillah, I could see this peace and, and tranquility in the city of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That people are here are happy, and that means that we from you know we are actually doing a good job as well. So he was patrolling, and then suddenly he was very tired. He sit he sat at a corner of a house, and then suddenly he hears a noise coming from that house. One of the old ladies she said, "Oh my daughter, get up." and go to that bucket of water and bring me a jug of water so that I could add the jug of water to the milk. So when we add water to the milk, because they were milk traders, then we will make more profit. We'll make, you know, in, instead of selling four pints of milk, we'll be selling about six pints of milk and we're going to make more money. Now, this is the interesting discussion here, is that actually they will make more money because if you, if you were to sell four pints of milk, there's a certain amount of money you will get. Let's say you'll get about four pounds. But if you sell six, you'll get six pounds, for example. So you could see that, you know, they, they'll make more money. But her daughter, she happened to be listening to the khutbah of Amir al-Mu'minin, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. She said, but my mother, you know, we have to stop this practice because our Amir al-Mu'minin, the leaders of the faithful, the believers, Amir al-Mu'minin, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he made a, uh, 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 he gave a command today. There's a decision that was passed on. So what is the decision? The decision was that no one would be mixing any water with the milk because this is a form of deception. And the Prophet wasallam said, Man ghasha falaysa minna. Anyone who does gush, we heard that word before in Bengali language. Man ghasha, anyone who deceives. He's not amongst our community, the Prophet wasallam said. The one who deceived, cheats and fraud, tell him he is not amongst my communities. Meaning, I've got nothing to do with him, the Prophet of Allah is saying. Tell him he's not going to get my intercession on the hereafter. And he's not, a Mus we Muslim communities, we don't cheat, we don't deceive, we don't do that. That's what the Prophet of Allah said. Man ghasha falaysa minna. He who deceives, not amongst us. Now the mother replied, okay, but Umar is not, in, innaki mawdi'in, la yaraki Umar. But my daughter, we, you are at a place where Umar is not watching you. The reply was, Umar la yarana, walakin Rabbu Umar yarana. Umar might not be looking at us now, but the Lord of Umar ibn al-Khattab is looking at us. Ma kuntu uti'uhu, ma kuntu li uti'uhu fil mala wa a'asihi fil khala. I cannot obey the command of Amir al-Mu'mineen in public and then disobey him in my seclusion. I can't do that, O oh mother. Umar was listening to the whole of this conversation outside the house. With Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there was his assistant called Aslam. He said to Aslam, put a mark on this door. Because in the olden days, they never had no door numbers, you know. Put a mark on this door. And the next day, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he sent Aslam to investigate. Who this? He said, find out, man al-qa'ila, 
Oh, man il maqooli laha. Maqoolu laha. Find out who is the one who was talking and who was she addressing. Wa hal laha min ba'al. And the young one, does she have a husband? So Umar came, he goes, uh, Aslam came, done his investigation, went back. He said, Amir Mu'mineen, there's an old lady, they don't have any male in this house. And they do some, you know, they are milk traders, you know, they have a camel and this is what they do. Basically, they sell camel milk. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he gathers all his family members. Remember, there is no one has seen anyone here. He doesn't know nothing about them, how she looks or anything like that. Umar gathers his family, he gathers his children. He, at that time, he had three, three boys. One was Abdullah bin Umar, we all heard of his name, the one who narrated so many hadiths to us. One was Abdurrahman ibn Umar, and one was Asim ibn Umar. All three of them were there. Umar said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu to son, to all of his children, he said, my sons, you guys know I'm an old man now. Yeah? I have no desire of marrying. Otherwise, I would not even sit down to talk to you guys today. <laughs> What is it, Father? What is it? Tell us, the children are saying. I think I found a very beautiful wife for you guys. So I want to start with you, Abdurrahman. What do you say? Abdurrahman, sorry, Abdullah. Abdullah was the eldest. Abdullah, what do you say? Abdullah bin Umar said, Father, inna li zawja. As you know, I have a wife and I don't desire another wife. You know, this is another idea as well that, oh, you know, Arab, they only want four and all these people they spread. No, not every time. Not everyone like that. He said, look, I'm, I have a wife. I'm happily married and I don't desire another wife. Very clearly he said no. Okay, what about you, Abdurrahman? Abdurrahman said, Father, I'm like my brother. You know I have a wife and at this moment I do not desire another wife as well. So thank you very much for your mashwara, your, but I don't desire another wife. Very simple conversation happening, open conversation. From this we could also learn as well that the role of a father is this. And children should learn that if you want to marry someone, you don't go and talk to the girl, you talk to your father. You know, get your, talk to your parents, you know, they're there to help you, assist you. It's the British, uh, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't, it's the British values that we were learning, not so much Islamic values, you know, let me put it this way. Talk to your parents. There's no need to be a secret marriage, you don't have to run away. The parents are there to help you. And parents, we have to be like Umar ibn al-Khattab. Open discussion, there's no haya in this. Tell, are you ready to marry? Yes. Now Asim was the youngest one looking, said, Father, you know, I've been waiting for you to ask me this question. So I asked him, what do you say? The father, I don't have no wife. And the way you're talking about this lady that you know about her sounds like she's a very pious lady. I am ready for marriage, father. So I'm ready to marry her. Umar looked at him and he said, oh, my son, you made me so happy today. I really want you to marry this lady because she's a woman who fears Allah. And if you marry a woman who fears Allah, you will have pious children, inshallah. By the way, no details were checked. What kind of background they have, what kind of money they are making. Do they have a house? Do they have anything else? Nothing like that. Purely on taqwa. Asim goes, sees the, uh, the, the girl that he wants to marry, and he replies that to Umar that, yes, I'm happy. I'm happy with everything that you said. I, I don't mind going ahead now. Now, both of them are happy now. Mia Bibi Razi, Kya Karega Qazi, both of them are happy to marry. They do marry. Guess what happens, everybody? Both of them, they have a daughter. Her name was Layla. The Layla then marries a man called Abdul Aziz. And they have a son called Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And I spoke about the wife of Umar bin Abdul Aziz last week, Princess Fatima. Well, this is the story. It's the result of all the taqwa. Result of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in every time. Always giving preference to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you lose few pounds. Maybe you lose some money. On the other hand, the time that we're living in, we think that, you know what, if I were to cheat if i were to deceive or let's just say if i were to lie a small little lie then i could make more money the money that you make by lying and cheating and deceiving that money has no baraka how many people that we know they sell cars for example they know the car is faulty they know probably 100 percent they know the car is faulty they will conceal the, uh, the, the the faults of the car so that they could make some more money, 100 or 200 or 1,000 pound like that. And they're very happy. You know the 1,000 pound extra that you make by lying and cheating? You probably would enjoy the 1,000 pound for a week or two or a month or two. That's it. Wallahi al-Azim, there will be no barakah, no blessing in that money. But if you were to make any money by speaking the truth and, and, and following the guidelines of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our Sharia, even if you make little, Allah will put so much barakah into that little. Can I just quickly explain the meaning of barakah here? Barakah means blessings. What does that mean? It means that 
Say that you have a lot of needs to fulfill. Lot of needs to fulfill. Yes, sometime with the little money that you have, if it's earned the halal way, Allah will fulfill all your needs. All your needs will be fulfilled with the little money. On the other hand, you have a lot of needs to fulfill. You have a lot of needs to be fulfilled. But you have earned the money in a haram way. Guess what? You will never fulfill all that needs. In fact, your needs will increase even more. And on top of that, there will be a lot of psychological issue, issues as well in your mind. You'll be thinking, what did I do that for? I, know, and I don't think you'll get sleep in, in, in the night properly as well. And this is the thing that we have to always treasure. Companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they didn't care that they lose some money. They cared if they were to violate or break any commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how they were. To them, the commandments were everything. There was an individual, he was actually grieving. They told him, why are you grieving? Why are you crying? He said, I missed my Asr Salah. Do you find anyone in our time, he's actually crying because he missed a Salah? No, he's going to give you two, three fatwas. Oh, it's okay, I could pray this time and that time, all of that. But this guy was grieving. He didn't miss his complete Salah. He missed Jama'ah. So they said, why are you grieving? I don't understand. This time you could pray like that. He said, you don't understand. I missed the Jama'ah. <laughs> what a time they lived. And he said, but there's nothing to be grieving about, brother. You could pray. He said, what do you mean? If a person were to miss his Asr Salah, the Prophet said, It's like he lost his family or his money. I cry if someone dies in my family. I cry if I lose any money. Why shouldn't I cry that I miss the congregation praying behind the Prophet That's how the people were. They always treasured and valued the commands of Allah and the Sunnah of our Prophet That is the reason why they shined. That is the reason why we read their stories and we are still today, 1400 years later, we are still inspired because they always gave preference to Allah's hukum and the sunnah of his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah give us all the tawfiq inshaAllah ta'ala. Ameen. Aqulikhu bihad astaghfirullah.